In this lesson, we're going to move beyond protocols and we're going to look at how these operate at a network level and how we can use circuit switching and packet switching as techniques to send data packets or files over a network such as the internet. So you should be able to show understanding of the function of a router in packet switching and perhaps even circuit switching. Show understanding of circuit switching and packet switching and explain how packet switching is used to pass messages across a network, including the internet. So let's begin with a prior knowledge check. Do you know what is meant by a data packet, a network, what is meant by the term internet and what a router is? Now you should be familiar with these keywords from AS level. So pause the video and perhaps review your notes from last year or look up these terms on the internet. Okay, you should have picked up that a data packet is when a message is split up into smaller groups of bits for transmission over a network. And what a network is basically a connection of devices which allow you to share information and there are different types of networks such as client-server, peer-to-peer, lots of different topologies. The internet should be pretty straightforward. It's a connection of networks which is global and a router is basically a device which enables data packets to be routed between different types of networks. So again, nothing too complicated here. Now let's get back to the requirements for communications. And one fundamental way of differentiating different technologies is based on a method that's used to determine the path between devices over which information will flow. Now think about this. If you have devices which are just connected by one wire, chances are that data transmission is pretty straightforward. But in networks, things become very complicated, especially if the distances become huge, like global. So in simplified terms, there will be two approaches. Either you have a path which you fix at the beginning to communicate between these two devices, or you might decide to divide the data into little packets and send them through different paths so they can arrive at the destination using something called a variable path. The path varies every single time that you do a transmission. Now, in order for circuit switching and packet switching to actually function, the technology which is most responsible for allowing the internet as a whole to exist is the router. And when you send a message from one computer to another, it's all done via routers because these are crucial devices that let messages flow between different networks rather than within networks. Within a network, you're probably going to have switches and hubs and all sorts of other networking devices. But once you get out of your internal network, you're probably going to be using a router. Now the router is the only device that sees every message sent by any computer on a company's network because when you want to send something outside, it has to pass through the router. And one of the most important tools the router uses to decide where a data packet should go is a configuration table. Now we're going to be looking at configuration table, also known as routing tables, in a bit more depth later on as well. But let's start by looking at what their role is. Configuration or routing table is a collection of information which is in the form of a table, and that includes information on which connections lead to a particular group of IP addresses, perhaps, priorities for connections to be used, rules for handling both routine and special cases of traffic. Now, this table can be as simple as half a dozen lines in the smallest of routers. Think of the router that you have in your own house, perhaps, but can grow to a massive size and has varying degrees of complexity in the very large routers that handle the bulk of internet messages. So perhaps the school will have a router which is quite complicated because it has to deal with thousands and thousands of devices. And the ISP has to deal with other routers and thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands of devices. So a lot of complexity and a lot of processing is required to handle that type of data. So the configuration tables can be very small or can be quite huge. Now, in the most complex of cases, the router has two jobs. The first one is to ensure that information doesn't go where it's not needed, which is crucial for keeping large volumes of data from clogging connections of innocent bystanders over the internet, and to make sure information does reach its intended destination. So in order to perform these two jobs, a router is quite useful in dealing with two separate computer networks. It joins two networks, it passes information from one to the other, and in some cases, it even performs translations of the various protocols between the two networks. Now, if you want to find out a lot more about routers, perhaps you need to revisit the notes from AS level, which give you a lot more detail of what a router actually does. 
But for us, we're just going to focus on the role of the routers to protect networks from one another, preventing the traffic on one from unnecessary spilling over to the other. So it acts as kind of like a gateway. As the number of networks attached to one another grows, the config table becomes bigger and bigger. And that means the processing power of the router needs to be increased as well. So regardless of how many networks are attached, the basic operation and function of the router remains the same. And since the internet is one huge network, which is made of tens of thousands of smaller networks, its use of routers is an absolute necessity. Now that's enough about routers. Let's start looking at what circuit switching is all about. Now circuit switching was introduced to you back in unit two when we were talking about networks and how PSTN was used to make a phone call. And circuit switching uses a dedicated channel or a circuit which lasts throughout the connection. So the communication line is effectively blocked. When you're sending data across the network, there are normally three stages. First, a circuit between a sender and receiver must be established. Now on screen, you see a circuit being established within a network. So this could be a local area network where switches are used. And if you were looking at it globally, routers would be used to block a circuit over the internet. Now once a circuit is established between the sender and receiver, data transfer then takes place. And it could be analog or digital, but mostly it will always be bidirectional because you have to have a two-way connection. After the data transfer is complete, the connection is then terminated. So you're reserving the entire line to allow two devices to talk to each other. So information about the nature of this circuit is actually maintained by the network itself. And the circuit may be a fixed one that's always present. For example, you might lease the entire circuit from a telecommunications company. Or it may be a circuit that is created on an as-needed basis on an ad hoc level. So after your use, it reverts back to the original network. Now, if there are any other potential paths to other intermediate devices that might exist between the two devices communicating, only this path will be used. And that's one of the problems with circuit switching, that, for example, if that path has a fault, you can't use any other path because you've agreed on circuit switching. Now the classic example of a circuit switch network is the PSTN network or the telephone system. So when you call someone and they answer, you establish a circuit connection and can pass data between both devices regardless of how many intermediate devices are used to carry your voice because that path is reserved for your communication only. The circuit is used for as long as you need it and it's then terminated. So circuit switching systems are ideal for communications that require data to be transmitted in real time. So think about live video broadcasts, live audio broadcasts. Those kind of systems would probably use circuit switching. Now on screen, you see a summary of what we've discussed so far, the advantages and disadvantages of a circuit switching network. So pause the video and perhaps jot these down. Advantages obviously are that the entire circuit is used for your single transmission, so the whole bandwidth is available, which means you can have a faster data transfer rate, and packets arrive in the same order as sent, and packet loss is minimized due to the same circuit being used. Ideally, at times, you will suffer no packet loss because everything travels down the same path. Now, disadvantages are obviously this is not very flexible. You use a single line. Nobody else can use the circuit even when you're not using it. There's no alternative in case of a fault. It obviously requires greater bandwidth because you're reserving the entire circuit. Time required to establish the circuit link at the start can be longer because both parties need to agree which circuit they're going to use. Okay, that's all about circuit switching. We're going to now move on to packet switching, which is a different way of sending data across the internet. And routers play a prominent part in breaking things down, inspecting packets, and making sure they arrive at their destination. So let's begin with packet switching. Now, packet switching was introduced back in Unit 2 when we were describing voice over internet protocol. On screen, you see a diagram which shows how a file could be broken down into different packets. These packets are then sent over different paths and then reassembled at the end on the receiving device. So packet switching is a method of transmission in which a message is broken up into a number of packets that can be sent independently to each other from start point to end point. The data packets will need to be reassembled into their correct order at the destination. 
Now you need to note that each packet follows its own path. Routing selection depends on the number of datagram packets waiting to be processed at each node, which basically in a network is a switch and outside the network is a router. The shortest path available is then selected. Packets can reach the destination in a different order to that in which they are sent. So we might send it out as 1, 2, 3, 4, but they might arrive as 3, 4, 2, 1. So in this type of a network, there is no specific path which is used for data transfer. Instead, the data is chopped into small pieces called packets and sent over the network. And packet switching is the method by which the internet actually works, and it features deliveries of packets of data between devices such as routers over a shared network. Now, there are lots of different examples you can think about this. A school web server sending you a web page over the internet, or you send an email to a friend. The packets can be routed and combined as required to get them to their eventual destination. So on the receiving end, the process is reversed. The data is read from the packets and then reassembled into the form of the original data. Now, to get from one device to another, the data packets will have to travel through network adapters, switches, routers, and other network nodes. The route taken by each packet might vary, and at times there might be a lot of data traveling through these nodes, meaning packets will have to be queued up. As a result of this, the delivery time varies of how these packets arrive at the destination, and that depends on the traffic load on the actual network. Now, it's also possible for packets to get lost and keep bouncing around from router to router and never actually get to their destination. Eventually, the entire network could grind to a halt as the number of lost packets mounts up and up and clogs up the entire system. To encounter this, a method called hopping is used, and a hop number is added to the header of each packet. So each packet is only allowed to hop a finite number of times. We'll talk about hopping in a bit more depth later on. What you need to know about packet switching, though, is the steps that are taken to send data from one device to another. So let's start with those. So first, data is split into packets. Each packet has a header, which includes source address, destination address, and a payload. Now we'll talk about the header again in a bit more depth in a moment, but let's leave it at that. If data requires multiple packets, then the order of each packet is also noted. Packets are sent onto the network, moving from router to router, taking different paths and these paths are normally set by the router. Each packet's journey time can differ. Now the router checks the header against the routing table to identify the next hop, or eventually set the value to zero if it's reached maximum hops. And once the packets arrive, they are reordered. A message is sent from recipient to sender indicating the message has been received, but if no confirmation message is received, the sender transmits the data again. So some mechanism of error checking or checksums or ARQs is also part of this transmission. So let's look at the packet switching summary, both advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages are there's no need for a separate line. Failed lines or routes can be avoided using routing algorithms. It's easy to expand. Costs can be lower as you aren't charged for the entire line, only the duration of the connectivity. And a high data transmission rate is possible here. The disadvantages are that the protocols used can be quite complex compared to circuit switching. Lost packets will need to be resent, which wastes time. It does not work really well with real-time data because packets don't arrive on time in the right sequence and they have to be reordered, so it becomes quite tricky. Bandwidth needs to be shared with others and there's normally a delay at the destination when the packets are reassembled. So comparing both circuit switching and packet switching, circuit switching, there's an actual path that's been created between the source and destination Whereas for packet switching, there is no path. You just make the path as you go along. All packets for circuit switching use the same path, whereas packets in packet switching travel independently. The entire bandwidth is reserved in advance for circuit switching, and that's not the case for packet switching. So there's a lot of bandwidth wastage with circuit switching, and there is no bandwidth wastage with packet switching. And finally, with circuit switching, there is no store and forward transmissions. You don't need to store the packets because you're just forwarding them to the right path. Whereas with packet switching, you need to support store and forward transmission because packets might arrive at a router from multiple different senders and they end up being queued up. So you need to make sure that they're stored before they are transmitted to the next point in their journey. Now that's all about packet and circuit switching. Let's delve a bit more deeper into three things that were mentioned in this video earlier. 
The first one is the packet header. Now the packet header has the following makeup if you're using TCP IP. The header will include the IP address of the source, the IP address of the destination. We know this part because that's commonly mentioned. In addition to that, it will also include the hop number, the length of packets in bytes, the number of packets that are in the message, the sequence number of the packet, and a checksum value for error checking. Now, other protocols might add protocol versions like IPv4 and IPv6, the length of the header itself, the priority information for the packet, any fragmentation data, and any kind of transmission protocol like TCP and UDP. I want to draw your attention to the checksum value and perhaps the priority ones as two important bits of information. Each packet contains an error checking technique such as a checksum or a parity check. And if a checksum is used, the value is calculated for each packet and added to the header. The checksum for each package is then recalculated at the destination to ensure no errors have occurred. If the checksum values are different, then a request is made to resend the packet. So you can automatically see that a number of error checking techniques, ARQ plus checksum or ARQ plus parity checks are used to ensure that packets don't suffer from any kind of loss or corruption. The packet priority on the other hand basically is a value that's often added to the header itself. A high priority value indicates that the packet is going to be placed higher up in a queue when it reaches a router because routers might end up with a queue that has hundreds or even thousands of data packets. So a high priority value says bump them up. This is a VIP packet. The next item we're going to look at is hopping. Now packets can get lost and bounce around forever if you're using packet switching. That means the network could actually grind to a halt because you might have packets that were never delivered and they're still bouncing around in the network. To overcome this, a method called hopping is used. And in this case, a hop number is added to the header statement of each packet. Each packet is only allowed to hop a finite number of times, and this number is determined by the network protocol and the routing tables being used. Each time a packet passes through a router, the hop number is decreased by one. So if the packet has not reached its destination and the hop number equals zero, then it will be deleted when it reaches the next router. Similarly, if the router cannot find a route, it will automatically set the hop number to zero because it says, well, I'm not connected to any kind of router that can take it to its destination. So this helps reduce network traffic and preserves bandwidth as well. The final item we're gonna talk about is the routing tables or the configuration table as we discussed earlier. Routing tables contain the information necessary to forward a packet along the shortest or the best route to allow it to reach its destination. As soon as the packet reaches the router, the packet header is examined and compared with the routing table. The table supplies the router with instructions to send the packet to the next available router, which is basically a hop. So the routing table contains the following information. The number of hops, back address to the next router where the packet is to be forwarded to. So this is basically where it will be the next hop metrics, which is basically a cost assigned to each available route, so the most efficient route or path is found, network destination or pathway or network ID, gateway, the same information as the next hop, it points to the gateway through which the target network can be reached, net mask, which is used to generate the network ID, and an interface value, which indicates which locally available interface is responsible for reaching the gateway. Now you don't need to know what each of these do, you just need to know that the routing table has important information and instructions to help the packet hop to the next available router to reach its destination. Okay, that's it for now. Hopefully we should know what the role of a router is in networks such as the internet, what are the benefits and disadvantages of circuit switching, and similarly, what are the benefits and disadvantages of packet switching. In addition, you should know what goes on in a packet header, what the purpose of the routing table is, and what is meant by hopping, and what a hop number is all about. If you do have any questions, do get back to me. Otherwise, that's it, and I'll see you in the next one.